All right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Beneath the Surface. This lecture is sponsored and made possible by Marathon, who helps us to bring you um, some amazing speakers on topics from all over the place. And tonight, we're going to learn a little bit more about vaquita conservation from uh, Enrique Sanjuro, someone who I've worked with for a number of years now on um, vaquita conservation. To introduce Enrique, um, Enrique is an environmental economist with 26 years of experience in design, implementation, and evaluation of projects, programs, and environmental policies. For the last 16 years, Enrique has focused his career on ocean protection, sustainable fisheries, and the development of coastal communities. He's an economist from ITAM in Mexico and has, a, has PhD studies at the University of, uh, in, at a university in Spain. I was going to butcher it, Enrique. Uh, he works now as an independent consultant and, and director general of PESCA um, ABC, ABC standing for Alternativa de Baja California. Um, Enrique and I have worked together for a number of years on vaquita conservation. Um, currently, Enrique is supporting efforts of um, Vaquita Safe, which is a program uh, that I helped to support out of uh, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to you, Enrique. Thank you, Dave. And th thank you all for, for, for being here this evening. My, my talk today, it's, it's less about Vaquita, but more about this effort called Pesca ABC, Pesca Alternativa de Baja California, and how local community engagement is a, a very key element for solving human wildlife conflict. So in this case, we will be talking about the vaquita and, and bycatch, bycatch of vaquita by getting entangled and in, in nets used by fishers. But I think that the model and the, and the way Pesca ABC is working, it's, it's useful uh, as, as, as an important element for, for general these human wildlife conflicts that, that we can see in different terrestrial and marine ecosystems. Uh, so, I will start talking about drift gill nets. So this is vaquita. For those that are not familiar with vaquita, is the smallest cetacean on earth. And it's at this moment the, the most endangered cetacean. And the main cows, and some experts, and, and probably most of the experts are really the only cows, cows of the decline of vaquita is the use of drift gill nets by artisanal fishermen. Uh, it's important also to see that, that there are many small cetaceans in danger in the world. And all of them, if not the only causes gillnets, all of them has had as one of the important causes of its decline with gillnets. So learning how to manage with gillnets used by local fishermen, it's, it's relevant for stopping this, this escalate of extinction on of small uh, cetaceans and, and marine mammals in general around the world. Uh, this, I'm not pretending you can read every single small letter in this graph, but every, every single balloon here shows a public policy that could be a marine protected area, a wildlife refuge, a fishing restriction, uh, or even subsidies programs, or a lot of different policies focused on saving vaquita. And all these policies had not been this enough. This meeting is being recorded. These policies had not been enough for uh, for stopping that the, the decline of vaquita. I am not saying with this that, that these policies were not important. Or necessary, probably some of them were and still being important, but certainly had not been enough for for actually saving or, or, or protecting Bakina. In some cases, because it's just policy in paper with not the, the complete enforcement, but also because there is not or there has not been the, the right engagement of the people that make enforcement possible and the policy accepted by the people so 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 it so we do have effects. In this in this graph that, that you can see Bakita 
uh, in in a few years, in 30 years, coming from more than 800 individuals to almost zero, almost extinction. Uh, I, I mark three, four, four, four moments that will be relevant in, the, in this presentation. One is Pase Vaquita, that it's a, uh, in Spanish, Programa de Acción para la Conservación de la Especie de Vaquita, that will be translated as Action Program for Saving Vaquita Species, that if you can see it like slow down the slope that we were having, this, 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 this program was really taking into account communities and, and, and the numbers really show it. I, I, I mark another moment that it's important, that is Totoaba. What is Totoaba? Totoaba is a fish that has this green bladder. This green bladder has a, a very high price in the black market. It's, it's prohibited to, to fish Totoaba. And then there was a, an excess of demand because of some other phenomenon happening in China. The, a very similar fish called Mahaba go to very low levels. So the Chinese market arrived to, to, to Baja California and, and, and start uh, requiring Totoaba. And that, that Totoaba boom in, in prices really affects Vaquita. And because the Vaquita and Totoaba are almost the same size, the, the size of the mesh, the mesh size of the gigamet that used for Totoaba is also very efficient for killing Vaquita because it's, it's, it's working on, on that side of, of species. So Totoaba is a super big fish when, from 1.5, more than 1.5 meters. And Vaquita is a very small uh, cetacean, 1.5. So being at the same size, it, it's very difficult. I also mark here in this graph prohibitions. In 2015, because of the decline of Vaquita, the government started setting huge prohibitions, uh, just banning fish. So from 2015 to 20, for now, it's mainly prohibited, it's prohibited to, to fish in that area. Now, it, from 2015 to 2018, was completely banned fishing, and now it's allowed without humans, which, which makes more sense. Uh, and I also mark here 2016 when Pesca ABC was created. So please interrupt me if, if, if you have some doubts in the way. And I also will, even Pesca ABC was created in 2016, the story of Pesca ABC goes back all the way to, to, to 2009. Uh, what's this story? From 2009 to 2011, government start paying some tests for, for, for alternative yield. And at the end in 2011, government said, okay, this alternative year is not working, it's not catching enough. So uh, at that moment, I was working at WWF and WWF pay the, the observer program. So I have the, the data for, 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 those, for, for those tests. And I found that 20% of the fishers made 80% 80% of the cuts. So it was not, the average was not a good measure of what was happening. Very few fishermen were catching a lot. A lot of fishermen were catching anything. So uh, we start when I'm saying we was WWF and Pronatura local and you start uh, knocking the door of these 20% uh, of the fishermen, more, more or less 20 fishermen because uh, the size of the of the, of the sample was around 100 fishermen, and found that they were actually catching a lot, and they and they think that the alternative year was working. So we started working with them, and from 2012 to 2015, we work a lot with these fishermen, making several tests for improving alternative year, not only for shrimp for fin fish. It was a, a lot of work, and also once we start working with these fishermen. We start engaging them in other activities such as acoustic monitoring. So in this time, these fishermen were like angry with the fishing federations. There is this structure um, and the fisher on the artisanal fisheries in Mexico that they are structured in cooperatives, and the cooperatives are are structured in federations of cooperatives. And these fishermen that were working with us were kind of angry with their federations because they knew this alternative gear was working, 
but federations that were negotiating with the government, they said that they were saying in these negotiations that this alternative year was destroyed. So they were thinking and creating a new federation or creating a new cooperative. And on that way, they decided to create a non-governmental organization. And in 2016, PESCA ABC was created. So, but at that, more or less at the same time in 2015, there were these years, 2015 to 2018, of prohibitions. So the main work of PESCA ABC that was uh, working with alternative gear was kind of stopped because they were, there, was not, there was no way for doing that. And PESCA ABC started focus on more on, on retrieving ghost nets. Nets that are abandoned, mainly Totuaba nets because they are illegal, but they were caught by the authorities. They caught the net and abandon it and go to the bottom and, 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 and an abandoned net is super dangerous because it's, a, it's a, a net that is designed for killing. And once it's abandoned, it's still killing. And it's still killing fish and it's still having the possibility of killing. Back. So the, the main focus of PESCA ABC in 2017 until 2020 was uh, retrieving ghost nets and, or, or locating ghost nets that, that will be retrieved by big vessels from Museo de la Ballena and Sea Shepherd. And finally, in 2020, again, fisheries, fish, fisheries were reopened, or were reopened uh, from, since 2018, started being reopened gradually, not for use of yield, but for the use of alternative gear. And there was this opportunity of returning back to the origins of PESC ABC and start testing and pushing for, uh, for, for alternative gear. Uh, so in 2021, I, I start, I, I, I took the, the direction of PESC ABC. That was also the part of, of my personal story that in 2019, 2020, I was at WWF since all this process. And here these two years, WWF decided to stop working at the upper Gulf of California. Uh, so, uh, and, and that was a, a point of, of, of discussion with my own organization. Uh, and in 2020, we decided both WWF and myself that it was time to, to, to move on. And I start taking the direction of PESC ABC till now. And now we have, uh, we, we are rescuing part of acoustic monitoring, uh, ghost net retrieval, but also an, an, a lot of importance on, 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 on fishing technology. Uh, what is the long-term vision of PESC ABC? So, so we see ourselves, sorry, as this bridge between the conservation community and scientific community and the fishing community. So PESC ABC, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an organization of fishermen. All our board are fishermen. The people, the people working in PESC ABC are, are fishermen. So, so it's, it's, Fish, so, 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 so it, it's, it's an organization of fishermen, a grassroots organization of fishermen. But, but we have in PESC ABC and, uh, and, and the people in, in, in my board, this idea that sometimes uh, scientists and, and, the con and the conservation, uh, uh, people doing conservation, the, the, uh, the conservation community, doesn't do not listen. To, to what the fishermen want to say. And also the conservation community and the side say, okay, fishermen are not listening to our advice. So, so we believe and, and we, we, we think ourselves as this bridge between the, between the conservation community and science and, and, and the fishing community. And, and, and what we, we think is, is, is the way we can, we can change the upper Gulf and we can really create a, a change. So they're like, the, the equation is huge. But, but there are like simplifying the equation. We can, there are two, two, two main components. We have to increase the earnings of legal activities. How to make fishing without gildeds a profitable business. But also, we need to put pressure in government to to make to decrease the rents from illegal activities. We have to, to put pressure to government so the government will will be stronger on fighting illegal activities. And we have to move this part of the equation. 
So what best KVC will work is only in the green part, in increasing the earnings, uh, the earnings of legal activities. And there are other organizations that have more uh, uh, better capacities for working with governments, and they are working in the in the red part of the equation. We're not, as I'm saying, we are fishermen, and we don't want to fight with with, with the other fishermen in the community. And there are other organizations that can do well, but but we, we we can work in the green part of the equation, and both parts are indispensable for for achieving our goal. Uh, what kind of activities we are doing in PESC ABC? So as I was mentioning, fishing technology is in the bottom. It's, it's probably the, the most important one and the one that will help us to, to create uh, an important benefit for the fishermen. But also we complement these by doing conservation activities that are sometimes paid by governmental programs, sometimes paid by, by, by conservation partners that are important to be just for several reasons. One, we are actually helping in the conservation activities, but also engaging the fishermen to understand what the conservation community is doing. And I will, the next slides, I will be presenting uh, a little bit uh, uh, of, of some of this. So probably before I start going into the details of these, uh, for activities, I want to know if there are some doubts or comments at this moment. Okay, there's something in the chat. Ah, there's one question in the chat. Why WWF decided to stop working the Baja? That's a, that's a very good question. Security. In 2018, there were future riots in the in, in the in the area. Even some of, of, of the riots having having consequences, important consequences, and the the the, the direction of WWF thought um, that it was dangerous and it wasn't for the staff to continue being there. Uh, they they just stopped working there. Uh, in, in, by the other hand, I, I was pushing for for not abandoning the upper Gulf, having all the, and I believe we have it, yes, in PESC, we had it in WWF and, and, I, and we have it in PESC ABC, all the safeguards for working well. So uh, it, there is crime in the region, but while we have focused our work on helping the fishermen, at this moment, we haven't feel any moment to be are in threat or, 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 or we are putting in risk uh, our staff or fish. So, but that, that was the risk. Uh, I have other questions here. What organizations are focused on driving down the rents of illegal activities and what they are doing and how successful they are? So mainly our organizations putting international pressure so I can I can see Animal Welfare Institute putting a lot of pressure uh, in in CITES and in CITES and also CBD. It's also putting a lot of and, and NRDC also putting pressure at international level. What kind of pressure at the international level is happening? Uh, CITES, for example, they can punish Mexico if Mexico. It's not able to stop the traffic of Totuaba. Scientists can punish Mexico in all the different imports of, uh, uh, of, of a species under CITES agreement. Also, uh, fish exports to US uh, uh, through the Marine Mammal Act and through the fisheries restrictions uh, by the... By the uh, is this, I will remember the, the, the name of this act. Uh, Magnus and Stevens Act will, will stop fisheries that are illegal and Marine Mammal Act will stop fisheries or exports of fish that comes from activities that put in threat marine mammals. So, the, so, so through the Marine Mammal Act and the, and the Magnus and Stevens Act, uh, there are some organizations in the US that are putting a lot of pressure and, and, and and by restricting efforts, 
the government of the United States is putting pressure to Mexican government. So, so, so that's that's the way they are, we we are closing the, the thing, and, and it's safer putting pressure from U.S. or or, or from Geneva than putting that putting pressure from Mexico. That only that will be risky. That that will be, and we are not going to do that. Uh, yes, I will elaborate on acoustic monitoring in the next slide. So let me go for that. Not, it's not advancing. Okay, here we are. So what are we doing in PESC-ABC for the acoustic monitoring? So we are setting these uh, structures, setting these structures with the boy that we can identify the structure and down with anchors in the, uh, in the deep of the, uh, in the sea ground. And we put the hydrophone over here with a SIM card. So what we have is that because there are, there's still legal activity, we are putting these, these structures in the, in the no-take zone in an area that, that, we, that there should not be any fisheries at all. But because there is some illegal activities, we are losing some of the hydrophones. So for, for avoiding losing these hydrophones, we are changing the hydrophone. We are trying to change it every week. Sometimes we don't do it. So in Pesca ABC, what we do is the fishermen go and install the structures and they put the hydrophone. The scientists are the one that program the SIM card and they take the SIM card to, to read it. So this, uh, what the scientists know is the exact frequency of Bakita, uh, of Bakita sound. So Bakita uh, dives by echolocation. So they are, they are sending these sounds for, 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 for finding food and everything. So they, when the, the hydrophone captured these signs of echolocation with the computer, the scientists know exactly uh, if, if a bakita is there. The model, it's not a model for counting bakitas. The model calculates density of bakitas. Why? Because there it's not possible to either identify one of the bakitas that we are counting was a bakita that we counted before. So we can, we can know if the density of vaquitas is increasing or decreasing, but we cannot count them. So the number comes from the visual, from, from, from the visual uh, surveys and the tendencies and the modification from the acoustics. So, so the, acoustics, uh, the acoustics measure trends and the visual monitoring uh, estimate numbers. Uh, but with this, having acoustics, we can have uh, visual monitoring every 10 years or, or, or whatever. Uh, in the last two years, the numbers are so low that it's not really possible to, to, to have a, a good estimation with, with the monitoring. So I think that the next paper will come probably in a few months, but estimations that the, uh, the estimations are, are are less accurate every time because the numbers are, are, are getting low. Uh, I think I still having some questions in the chat. I don't know if the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act has, has applied to other species, but of course it has applied to vaquita. I'm sure, I don't know if it has applied to other species, but it has that, that capacity to be applied on, on other species. Uh, and let me go for the next slide. I don't know which state. Okay, here we are. This this slide is how we did the lo location of the of the ghost nets. So Again, we we are working mainly in the in the no take zone. Uh, here are the measures of the no take zone: twenty two point five kilometers and ten kilometers. So it's not a big no take zone. 
So we put, it's, I think, 10, 10, 10, 10 vessels with a distance, with a certain distance, each one. And here are all, these two are, are here perfectly measured. It's 14, 14 vessels sailing 50 meters one from each other. So at the end, we have, uh, we, we, are, we are cleaning 700 meters width. And with that, we start with this formation, we start making these, uh, these trajectories. That is, 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 is sailing the 10 kilometers four times. So if we use this, this uh, 10 kilometers movement using 14 pangas four times, then we can divide the no-take zone in these nine, nine places. So every day we go for a different place and that makes it for several days. So at the end, we clean all this area with, where there is a, the main density of Baki. The operation is the panga has a rope and a grumping. So the grumping detect the abandoned net. When it's detected, we mark it in the GPS and with a buoy. And then we, with the location, we call the big vessels from Navy, Sea Shepherd, or Museo de la Ballena, and the big vessels make the return. We don't do it with the panga. The main reason is that if the Navy see a panga with a totoaba gillnet, uh, they will not know if they are retrieving an abandoned net or fishing illegally. So we are not doing that. Uh, we are starting this, this, starting this year with a patrolling or sea scout program. And why do we do this? The Navy make this decision, and it's a very controversial decision, that all around the no-take zone, they will put these structures, concrete and a hook. And if a gillnet tries to go to the no-take zone, it will get trapped by these hooks. So if the Navy has the capacity of cleaning these hooks really fast and maintaining them clean, this could work for avoiding nets going to the no-take zone. But in the contrary, if the Navy is slow on cleaning these structures, or then the gilded that are, that, that, are, that are entangled there will continue killing fish and vaquita and probably creating zones of hypoxia if, 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 fish, if there is, it's all surrounded by, by dead fish. So it's a very controversial measure. The uh, board of Pesca ABC, the fishermen that are part of the board are completely against this measure. They, they believe that government will not be cleaning this. So what we are trying to do uh, by structures of the board is saying, Let's help other fishermen not get entangled. So we are patrolling around this area and saying, okay, there are these things here. Take your, 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 your gear far from here because you will get entangled. So that, in that way, we are helping that gillnets will not approach to the Vaquita area uh, or any other gear will approach to, to, to the Vaquita no-take zone. Uh, and, and we are also uh, avoiding having nets in these, in these hooks and, uh, and depending in, in the Navy. But they don't, have, they don't really have a plan on how many times a week they will clean us. So they just say, oh, we will clean it frequently. But they never define uh, what frequently means. So, 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 so having that, uh, so not having that defin definition of how frequently means, it's, it's super dangerous. And, and it's our opinion. So we are patrolling this area starting just this, Last month. And here is probably one of the, the things that, that uh, or is the program that was uh, the creation of Pest KBC and, and what really put the, the green parts going up, having legal activities that are profitable, that is developing, developing new gear. So we have been on this process for years and we have, we have improved 
things that are not creating new technologies, just improving the ways we use the traditional technologies like hook and line. So with simple improvements on, on hook and line, we are we are having a lot of success with with with, with Corvinas, for example. Uh, we are also making important modifications to to trolling. So we know that worldwide the use of troll in general, the conservation uh, world is against the use of troll, but there are some modifications suggested by FAO that can make trolling acceptable. And in cases like, like Vaquita, much better than the use of gilded. So we are also using some, 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 some troll techniques with these modifications uh, by FAO. We are also uh, testing traps and pots here with a lot of support from, from people from the Baltic. It's, 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 it's really impressive. For example, in Mexico, the fishermen know like three or four designs of pots. In the, the fishermen from the Baltic, they know more than 100 designs of, of, of pots and traps. So, so that, that they, are, they are providing a lot of help. There is also a, a, a design of, of, of net from Sinaloa, from southern Mexico, that, that, that we are testing called Suripera net. Uh, or, or dragon net that it, it's also we are testing that and also promoting other fisheries that they are not they are not using they have uh, clams and crabs and octopus and other things that, that that you can dive and you can fish differently they are not really taking advantage of those fisheries that could that could help on on, on taking the pressure of of using. Yeah, so we're, we're testing a lot of things. I think here that the international support of experts has, has been super relevant on, on having good designs. I still having some, ah, yes, trolling with T. Um, let's continue. Part of, of what we're doing is training. We are make, we are training fishermen, not just in the use of, of, of alternative gear, but how to repair it, how it works. And, and, and I think that that's super important because when they understand the way it works by building their own gear, uh, they, they fish better. There is, it's very easy to fish back if you don't understand that, how the, the net works. No matter how many times you go to the water, you will not fish. So, so if I go to the water now, I will not fish anything. So, so you need to understand how the, the, the gear work or making it work. And, and by building their own nets and having all this theory and, and, and learning how to build, we, we have noticed that they catch better. So, so building it's also an important part of the process. Markets, I, I really like this part of markets. So what we found, this is, this is a case of, of Curvina. It's Curvina, we are, we are catching Curvina with hook and line. And, but once we catch the Curvina, instead of taking the Curvina and in, in the boat and, and the Curvina dive for asphyxia with a lot of toxins, we are using a Japanese technique called Ikejime that we neutralize the neurological system of the, of the fish immediately. So the, the fish will not suffer and having and without pain, it will not be releasing the different toxins. So the, the, the flesh will be a little, will taste better and, 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 it's, and it's having a, a very good price in, in gourmet restaurants. And, 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 and so, so we are teaching fish how to, and, and fish with nets will not, Catch with gill nets will not be useful for this technique because in the in the gill net itself the, the 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 fish will die for asphyxia. So you need and, and also big long lines will not work. You need to catch one by one and immediately when the when when the fish is alive, you apply the ikajime technique and stops the, the 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 fish to suffer and and you have very very high quality that it's paying 
in some cases, 10, more, 10 times more than the market price. So we are making fishermen to, to, to participate without subsidies and without program. It's just a market uh, driving their decisions. And I think the market decisions are stronger than, than whenever, anything else that we can do. Uh, and finally, on technology, and, and this with, is with the support of ACA, and this is a project that we will start with the support of ACA, is it's, 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 we are trying to apply this diffusion of innovation model. The diffusion of innovation model is a model that is, has been used in, in, in technology for years and on how to make people uh, to incorporate new technologies on their lives. And they divide people in innovators, early adopters, uh, early majority, late majority, and laggards. So what we are, what we are experiencing in, in San Felipe is that we have been working for years with the innovators. And we, we, we have not been able to move from there. We have been working with the same, uh, with the same few innovators for years. So we are working, we, we have been working with around 20 fishermen, but we have been aware board and the, and the ones that are really engaged are about seven and eight fishermen. And we think that if we, and we want to, to go all the way to have 40 fishermen working with us, and, and, and move all the way to have the early adopters. The theory says that if we, are a, if we are able to go all the way to the early majority, the late, the late majority will come alone. We will not have to work on it. That will happen. And we don't have to worry about laggards. Laggards will be laggards forever. And we will not, there is nothing we can do for them. Uh, but, and we are, we are putting this model in practice. And, and with the ACA project, we, 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 are, we are moving all the way to the early majority. And that's what, and then I put some pictures of, of our staff and fishermen in their everyday work. And you can visit us in our webpage and we are also on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And thank you very much. So we are open. I'm open for questions and for having a conversation. That it's more the, the most richest part of these of these events. Thank you so much, Enrique, for sharing all of that. And I think um, as as people are gathering their questions, you can you can share those in in the chat if you'd like. Um, I think a, a critical thing that you're pointing out is is back in in 2015. Um, I will. I'll say I had a simple, you know, an overly simplistic view that um, gillnets were the problem, and so gillnet ban is the solution. Um, and I think your presentation is sharing with us today that there's a, there's a complexity that adds to if you're going to ban one thing, you need to then support um, those those fishers in that economy with some sort of alternative to what's been banned. Um, and the development of those alternative fisheries, I think, um, is sort of what lagged behind those efforts to, you know, to create the no-take zones and the and the bands of gear and, and whatnot. All right, we have a, a bunch of questions coming in. Um, uh, Terry is asking, he's curious about the ghost nets. Do they, do they drift in the ocean? Um, so if you, if you, if you clean one area, the nets can show back up later uh, at a later date. Can you explain a little bit more about um, ghost nets, where they come from, and how they get cleaned up? Yes. So, so ghost nets came from different sources. So probably the main source of, of ghost nets are those are totuaba nets, most of them, and uh, and it's because when when illegal fishermen are about to get caught, they see the patrol or the Navy close, they just cut the nets and abandon. And that nets go usually to the bottom. And in the bottom, in the bottom, they will still uh, fishing a, a lot of, of, or killing a lot of, of, of bottom species like, like shrimps or flatfish. But also the currents can, can move them and put in risk other species. 
Uh, there are also other reasons for abandoning a net. One, it's just for lack of, of for not being clean at the end, at, at the end of the life of a net, they, it's broken or something like that, and they leave it in the beach and then it returned to the sea. That's, that's something that, that, that also could happen. And uh, another thing that could happen is uh, bad weather, that they have to abandon the net or they lose the net because they can, couldn't find it because of bad weather. Uh, the uh, ghost that continue killing for days, quite, quite, you know, all the time while it's in the water. Sometimes when you have big events, some nets, for example, a month ago or a couple of months ago, there was a hurricane and we see a lot of nets in the beach because the, the hurricane throw, the, throw some, some nets back. Uh, so the, 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 the behavior of the net one in the sea, once in the sea will depend a lot on the currents and, 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 and and seasons and things like that. Um, so I don't know if that that was the question. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, the, the ghost nets are coming from uh, is sort of locally produced, right? They're they're coming in from fishers, not not from out of the area. They're coming from within the the upper Gulf region, from San Felipe or Penasco or or. Santa Clara, somebody's launching locally um, yes. to create those. Yes, all well, what we have found there, it's mainly nets that are used locally. We haven't found like a tuna net or a sardine mm -hmm. net or something that something that it's not being used locally. We haven't found anything like that yet. So Enrique, there's a question in here about um, the, 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 the demand for Totuabama in China um, and Sort of maybe your take on on yes I, I, if there's a, if there's a role to play there yes there there is a lot also also societies and international organizations are putting pressure to to the government of China for for stopping the demand uh, in our case as a grassroots organization of local fishermen of San Felipe we are not we, that's not the, the 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 place where we have the, the best added value. So we are not working on, on that, but but we know there are some some efforts. Uh, unfortunately, not not huge efforts. I think it's just like small things for for the picture and for the news. There, there's a lot of traffic of Totoaba going through the United States. So probably the main ports for this Totoaba traffic are the uh, the Chinese community in LA and San Francisco are, are the, the probably the are identified as, as some of the main poachers, and also there are important activities by U.S. authorities uh, for 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 those those two recognized places of of the travel traffic. I think uh, an important distinction to make is is also uh, within the United States, the and in Mexico, the penalties for trafficking in in wildlife products, in particular totuabama. Um, are far less than in similarly priced uh, commodities like um, illegal drugs, cocaine, uh, or things like gold as well. Illegally shipped, you'll 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 end up in in really big trouble for any of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but a similarly priced item is as a an illegally trafficked wildlife product like the tuabama. Maybe it's it's not so so much of a penalty. And those are our laws within both Mexico and the United States that are areas that we can improve upon. Um, from that uh, from that perspective, um, let's see. So there's a question in here about uh, sea shepherd, about whether or not they have a positive or negative impact on uh, conservation. Or I guess I added the negative part. Do they have a positive impact on conservation, or make it more difficult for organizations like yours? I, I think it's probably positive. Why? Because because it's Having having this good cop and bad cop situation, it's it's kind of it's it's good. So 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 people identified us as Pesca ABC, you are not Sea Shepherd. And 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 we and they help us to, to, to make this contrast. So they're doing their work. They are probably helping um and make more difficult for the poachers being there. Uh, people 
in in the upper gold they don't like C sharp, but but they they give us this contra contrast for saying PES KBC is not C sharp, but so so they are so having that contrast help us to to make our our work better, and probably having us working with fishermen let C Shepard do the, the, the work better. So uh, we have we have a say in Mexico, I don't know if it translates good in in, in, in English, let's let say uh, shoemaker do your shoes. So everyone has to do what they have to do. And and and, and having that, that division, it's it's always good for the for the totality of the of the process. Uh, so okay there's a question about um uh, funds available uh, within Mexico for um, sort of like a buyback program for uh, recycling or recapture of, of nets from from fishermen, I think is, is uh, what the question is asking. So I think you mentioned earlier on that one of the earlier uh, conservation measures was um, for buyback programs for, for gill nets. Yes, there was from 20... 08 to 2012, there was a buyback program for, for, but not was just the gilded, but the permit. It was not uh, uh, the idea of the buyback program and not recovering the net, but canceling the permit for, for reducing the fishing net. That was from 28 to 2012. 2014, maybe. Uh, and for the specific case of coast nets, there is not a national policy for buying nets or for avoiding nets, but at this moment, uh, or I think a few months ago, less than one year, probably six months or seven months, seven months ago, Mexican government signed or entered to be part of the Global Goal Security Initiative, and they are working on the national coast gear uh, program or national coast gear something. So they will have it will be a it, there will be a national program just for coast nets. And I don't know if that program will include these kind of things. So, but but it's not they are just building that 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 program at this moment. So we have another uh, more of a comment from from Bonnie um, about uh, she has uh, firsthand experience with providing healthcare in Baja uh, for many years, and noticed a significant increase in alcoholism and depression. Um, and, and linking that to sort of the, the issues and the problems um, with fishermen in, in the upper Gulf um, with, with the conservation measures that have been established in the space. And I think it's a, it's a point that, that, that we've talked about before and, and, and I know exists is, is there social consequences to um, these conservation measures. And, and it's, it's important for, for people on the outside, especially for you know, people participating in this lecture and, and the way that we think about global conservation is to think about what are those added consequences of of the conservation measures that we try to enact? But uh, from your from your perspective, um, do you want to share on that? Yes. So, for from my perspective, I'm trying to share that perspective of of, of, of my board of PESCABC. It was a disaster. The prohibition from 2015 to 2018, 2019, also uh, make that the legal fishermen and local fishermen they were taken out of the water. And there were all these social consequences like drugs and alcoholism, of course. And there was also a consequence in conservation because if you have fish in the water, someone will take it. It's not possible to have money without having someone taking that money. And who take that fish, drug cartels, and, Ill and working with illegal fishermen from abroad. So, while the legal and local fishermen were set out of the water, other fishermen that have this equipment or way of living that they were ready to take the risk of confronting the Navy, they take the city. When the prohibition was removed, then the legal fishermen returned to the water and the fishing effort was duplicated. The illegals were there and there was no way for taking them out and the legals returned back. And this, uh, and, and this double effort is creating a social tension for an eventual confrontation that has not happened yet. 
Uh, so there are there, there are a lot of consequences of that uh, of 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 that closure. I think more negative most of them. And I think from your presentation tonight and our conversation, it's clear that um, conservation is a human problem, and um, probably most. Uh, at least significant efforts from people who understand the interactions between people need to be applied um, when we try to solve some of these conservation problems. Um, and a lot of the work that you're doing now with um, Pesca Abaisei to introduce those alternatives, work through economic models um, to address that, that economy that is important for that space, I think is a critical step that we need to focus on. Yes, and I, I think these these human wildlife conflicts are, are, as I was saying at the beginning, are not just in the sea and not just like are uh, cattle raising and and predators are a lot, lot of different in a lot of different places. There are these human wildlife conflicts that it's not something that the human wants or the wildlife wants. It's some or like accidents or the, the two activities or two things happen in the same time. And we you have to, to work with both sides of, of the equation. If not, uh, you you probably will create bigger problems than the ones you want to solve. So there's a question about the environmental or ecological impact of the vaquita uh, in their habitat. So the sort of the ecosystem role that the vaquita plays, um, probably pretty insignificant today. Yes, probably was never the vaquita population was never to be, but. So I, I, I'm not a biologist, but, but some biologists have explained the, the evolution of vaquita. It was just uh, uh, this, this purpose of the south, this, uh, it's not a harbor purpose, but it's a similar to harbor purpose, but in the south, was migrating to the north. And some of them go through the Pacific and they continue their evolution and everything very normal. And some of them get trapped in the Gulf of California. So once the sea start getting kind of, of, of hot, they couldn't be great northern because there was no northern in the Gulf of California. But they couldn't go southern because it was even more hot. So they start to, uh, to evolve, making them smaller with bigger flips. Uh, for example, uh, humans, when you, when you are cold, you, can, you, you, you go and, and, and put your hands warm and all your body will be warm. So, so, so the, the, the hands and the flips in the case of, uh, of the cetaceans are the ones that control the temperature. So they have starting bigger flips, smaller size for having better control, uh, uh, control of the temperature. And, and they start to evolve and the one new species was transported, it was Paquita. And, and because this, this evolution they suppose that the population was never to be never like more than 5,000 or so. So they have never played a very important role in the ecosystem. So probably losing the vaquita will not have effects on the ecosystem at this moment. But of course we don't know. What we do know is that we are losing small cetaceans all around the world for similar situations. We don't know which of these last will really have consequences. But we could not expect losing small cetaceans all around the world without having consequences at some level. We, we will count them. We don't know which of these extinctions will be the, the bad one, but, but we, we, we could not expect continue extinguishing, extinguishing species without a consequence at some moment. Um, we have a question, and I think we'll we'll sort of finish with this last question is um, from Sam. Uh, how can we help? What is it that people can do best to support conservation for the vaquita? Um, so, so for the vaquita, we are now building this market for curvina. It's not yet available in the United States, but in general, I think probably for, for Vaquita, we, we, we will still have to create more market and, 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 and make it available easier. But I think our consumption, the, the way we make consumption, when we go to a restaurant, ask where this fish is from, what are the sustainability things, just probably the waiter will not know and the waiter will go and ask back to the kitchen and the kitchen will not know and ask back, but creating these 
start putting to the people this question of where did this fish come from? Who caught it? What are the sustainability measures? And start from the waiter to the cook, to the chef, to, to the provider, making these questions. And, and at the end, try to change the habits of consumption that make easier for everyone to create a market for sustainable products and more difficult for poachers and people not doing the correct thing to find a market for these products that are killing uh, the life in the sea. That, that, that probably is the, is the way you can help, probably at this moment not helping Makita because we don't have that, the, the, the supply chain that is right to, to, to US at this moment, but to help to the marine life in general. And, uh, and I think that, that that will be super important. And we have to recognize that the United States imports 90% of our seafood from international markets, including the upper Gulf up until 2015, um, with little to no regulation on uh, sustainability. So while we can all make consumer choices, when we have the, the, the privilege to make those choices, um, we can also work on our regulatory authority to, to ask our elected officials to look at how we import products that we have, seafood products in particular, and, and what the standards we have for monitoring and regulating those imported seafood products for sustainability. Um, so we all have a role to play. We're all connected internationally. Um, and you know, through our own personal choices and through our civic choices, uh, we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we we leave with uh, two comments of that sounds very positive, and uh, uh, the the people of Mexico in the Upper Gulf that Bonnie works with love the vaquita, and and I think we all want to see in uh, a preservation of biodiversity. I think it's really important to to note that um, you know there is a strong community of people who who want to see the natural history and natural heritage of Mexico preserved um, in that space. So thank you so much, Enrique, for taking some time thank to you, join us tonight to share your perspective. I uh, thank you all for joining us on uh, this this very um, important lecture. I think this very important topic. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.